I think by definition, lock the doors. We're close enough. <laughs> lock the doors. Okay, so, so he made me he, he made me promise to to apologize ahead of time. No, um. So Pearl Oasis for the last three years has had a um, tradition of giving the keynote speech to a director of the Enlightened Pearl organization. The first year we had um, Mike Whitaker come and, and give the speech. Last year, Mark Keating came and gave the keynote. This year, we tried to get another one, and it turns out we run out of ones who are willing to do it. <laughs> um, we tried getting Jay Curie to come. He couldn't do it. Matt Trout used the excuse of being at a German Pearl or a German programming competition. Yep. Um, Jay Shirley used, you know, left the post two years early to avoid the onus, um, and we flown run out. So when I ran out of EPO directors who were willing to do it, I turned to my fallback, um, Stephen. And I said, Stephen, so don't expect much. Stephen, I need you to give the keynote. He goes, you need me to do the what? I said, I need you to do the keynote. He said, that, that's, that's two talks, right? I said, well, yeah. And he said, fuck that. You're going to take out the other talk. <laughs> what do you want me to talk about? I said, I don't know, something. He said, fuck you. <laughs> but that, that didn't work as a title. <laughs> so, so, so I said, well, uh, how, many people, how many people have either seen Stephen's uh, keynote at Yassi last year or seen video of it? OK. Um, he gave a very great keynote that was a sort of a history of modern Pearl. And I said, well, do more of that, because that was really good. So he, um, he, yeah. came, yeah, he came up with something completely different. Well, he said, you, you no, no, the last thing we say is that was about a week before the conference started. So yeah, this, this was a week ago. Um, so he said, OK, I'll do something very similar to that. And then he gives me an outline, and he said, I changed my mind. And I said, whatever, you're doing the keynote. If it sucks, you're not doing it anymore. Um, which gave him a goal. <laughs> so I apologize to you very much what you see. And uh, Jeff, Doc, you may want to use this for your bad videos in the future. Okay. Thank you for this. And favorite excuse. Excellent. Thank you. So, so. Um, uh, I did a lot of talking with Corey Watson before this, um, and I actually didn't talk with Mark Keating before this, but we ended up seeming to come along on the same thing. Um, and uh, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about open source and what that means. We have a we have sort of a new client, and we had to actually justify our methods to them because they're they have a lot of lawyers in their company. So, ugh. Um, and of course that meant we had to explain, okay, it's open source, no, we're not giving everything away for free. Um, so it got me thinking a lot about what is open source and, and what does it mean. So, the title talk is uh, getting code for free because it is right open source. Um, and so this is a little love letter to open source. Um, so first thing I'd like to do is just sort of uh, do a little review. Okay. So the benefits of using open source software. Okay. The first most obvious pro is free code. Hey, we didn't have to write it, we didn't have to pay for it. Of course, there's downsides. There's no official <coughs> support contract. Of course, in some cases, an official support contract doesn't mean crap anyway. So, um, But, you know, you, you when you use open source software, you take on the burden of knowing, okay, I'm, I'm taking this, I'm using it as is. And most actual licenses will say there's no guarantee. Actually, most proprietary licenses will say there's no guarantee. Use it as is. Um, but it, it's even more so in open source software. Now, there's a big difference between using and participating, and that's actually sort of the theme of this talk. Um, and I think there's many more benefits of actually participating in open source software, not just using it, okay? The pros, free code again. You're still getting it for free. But you're also getting free testing, okay? You've got users, if you're, if you're releasing the software, uh, you know, you get users, they test it, they use it, they use it in context you may not have ever dreamed of. Um, if you're uploading it to CPAN, you've got the uh, CPAN's testers service. Every time somebody installs your module, it runs make tests. Uh, potentially, hopefully, sometimes they submit failing uh, tests back to you. Numbers. What's that? Makes yeah, exactly. So you, you, there's, there's a lot of free benefits to that. Free bug reports. You upload a module to CPAN, and you automatically get an entry in the RT uh, bug tracker queue uh, for your module. Okay, so people can very easily put in a bug, 
It's your choice whether you want to participate in RT or not, but it's there. And it's free. Yes, and it's free. And you have Hopefully, anything? free patches. That's great. Someone wants to contribute to you. You have it out there. If you if you don't put it out there, no one's ever going to contribute to it. Um, and also, it's a free recruiting tool. Okay, and I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, but I think that's an extremely important part about being involved in the open source community. And of course, there's drawbacks. Okay, you are giving away giving your work away for free. Okay, some people are very uncomfortable with that. Some people think that that's a bad thing. Um, and of course, there's still no support contract. However. <laughs> But now you know where these people hang out because you're involved in the community. You know who to find. You know, you know who to talk to. Who best to bug and say, hey, how come this doesn't work? Or hey, well, what about this? You know, is there a bug fix out there for it? Blah 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 blah. Um, if you're not involved in the community, you don't have that source of information. So let's go a little bit over how you might choose software. So if you've ever had to choose closed source proprietary software, okay? You know it is the root of all evil. It's horrible. You should never use it. It's gonna cost N hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're making a good decision. So what do you do? Well, you read the white paper. You look at their client list. What other suckers have they dragged into this? You download a demo version. Make somebody use it, fiddle with it, see, explore it, if, if it's even available. Um, and if it's not so completely locked down, it's completely useless. And last but not least, you Google product sucks, okay? which is an extremely informative way and a great way to find out a lot of things they're not going to put in their white paper. Um, now, contrast this with how you might choose open source software, in particular Perl, which of course is communism, the devil, we know this. It's bad for the American economy and everything. I originally Perl was coming in my idea. Uh, so first, you go to search.cpan.org, you enter term for each result, or if you're the functional programmer, you map each result. <laughs> That's the problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you read the docs, if they're there and if they're comprehensible and even, yeah. Um, but if there's no docs, you can read the source. You can start code diving. If the source is maybe too thick and difficult to get to, you can go find the test suite and you can start to read the tests. You can see how they're going about using this software because they're testing probably some of their assumptions in their unit tests. You can check the RPQ. Do they have a whole bunch of bugs and nobody's paying any attention to it? Uh, are they quick about resolving their bugs? Is the person a, you know, a nice human being? Do they not <laughs> yell at people for submitting bugs? You, know, you find out what you're getting into. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Check C pants. Okay, which is the C pan tester service. Okay, you can look at uh, you know depending upon how long the module's been out, you can look at potentially years worth of tests. You can see how often they broke with releases. You know, they put releases out and they just um, as my grandfather used to say, shit the bed. Okay, you don't want a module where the author is not going to be paying attention to back compat and things like that. And also importantly related to this, you can check that the tests for the module are patching on the platform that matter to you. Exactly. Thank you. So C Pants, if you don't know about it, also runs tests on tons of different platforms. So okay. maybe they use yeah. I'm a Mac user. I know it runs on there, but if you're a Linux <coughs> user, you might want to check C Pants, see if it works there. Or if your deployment server or whatever. You can also check for mailing lists. Okay, there's the at Perl.org mailing list, there's plenty of other mailing lists, Google groups, all that kind of stuff. If you can find it. You can see, is the author responsive? Are other people helping out? Uh, you know, is, there, is it even an active mailing list? You can get a lot from that. Um, you can check CPAN ratings, which for all they're worth, which is sometimes absolutely nothing, and sometimes, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good to see that other people like this. Maybe you know these other people, you trust their opinions. Check Perl months, who's asking questions about it. Okay, are people having a hard time understanding your module? You, you can see this is all information you can pull. You can actually contact the author. They may not contact you back, but yeah, sometimes. You yeah, sorry. Yeah, but their their email address is out there, so you can get to them. Okay, usually yes. You can ask the community if you're involved in the community. You can say, hey, do you know? Do you like this? Is it good? Is it bad? Wait, a second. that's a lot of work. Okay, 
for each module you're doing that? Well, obviously not for each module. You're gonna, you're gonna, some are going to fall out of the queue pretty quickly. But you know what? In the end, a good decision is an informed decision. And the sheer amount of information that you have out there for open source means you are making potentially a much better informed decision than you are with closed, closed proprietary software. Uh, closed source proprietary software. So, now, um, this brings me to my own part of it. Uh, we do something at work that I like to call designing with CPAN, okay? And it basically means to, for each project we start, we actually sit down and we try and figure out what role will CPAN play in this, okay? What's that? What CPAN modules can we use straight out of the box? Okay, so what, what do we know is out there? It's good, it works, it's gonna solve part of our problem. What can we use, but maybe need to contribute to? Okay, you're involved in this community. You may need to give back. You maybe need to extend that module. You maybe need to uh, write a better test suite, um, something like that. And what do we need to write from scratch? Okay. And we do this for every project. We sit down. We figure this out first. That's how we start building and designing. Um, because good software is reusable software. Okay. And I think that this is a very important point. This is actually a personal obsession of mine. I'll do a quick side to explain why. Um, I didn't go to school for computers. I actually went to school for art. I dropped out because that's very difficult to make a living in, and you know I wanted to not starve. Um, and so I'm actually self-taught mostly by books. Okay, I read a lot of technical books, and I started out doing a lot of JavaScript programming. And I was doing it during the dot-com boom. And as I'm sure all of you have done at one time or another, you've looked down on the JavaScript programmers because we're not really writing code. Um, we're just making UI widgets do this, but I so I, I didn't really have a lot of exposure to uh, to quote unquote real software out there. So because everything I knew about software I knew from books, I thought that all code was clean, well factored, nicely formatted, extensible, and built for reuse. You must be reading some awesome books. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> okay, that's not how the real world works. Okay, it's it's it's. It's nice when you're writing these very simple examples and stuff like that, but I sort of, I started out with this mindset of that. Um, and so I, I try to bring that, I mean, bring it into a real world context. So that's just a digression about my little session of that and why. So back to our regular schedule program. Um, good software is reusable software. Um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're working in a big e-commerce shop, like uh, magazines.com, software stuff, um, you know, you're writing many, many, yeah, Jay! Um, you're writing lots of components that you know. It, it, you, you have you have your your, your front end for your website. You've got the, the back end stuff that does data processing, fulfillment, all this kind of stuff like that. If each one of these components doesn't share components, you're doing it wrong. Okay. If you're a consultant, okay, and you're working for different clients, okay, you want to have a good toolbox. So each time you go to a new client, so the more clients, the more work you have, the more money you get. Okay. No one's going to sit there and pay you to reinvent the wheel every single time. So good software and reusable software. And important just for a business perspective. Which brings us to CPAN. CPAN is a huge repository. Okay? I'm sure somebody in here can tell me exactly how many lines of code there are out there, but I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 million. Now, 80% of them suck ass. Okay? But 20% of 16 million is nothing to laugh at. Okay, there's a lot of good stuff out there, and even the bad stuff is good. Which I won't tell. Why? Oops, sorry. Okay, even the bad stuff is good because your uh, it can be improved. Um, it's you you can look at the mistakes, you can see the problem they were trying to solve. Maybe it's close to yours. You can pull some bit of it out there. Okay, just having this huge resource of code is just it, it's what makes Perl Perl and what makes it good. Okay, so given that. Why can't we just say CPAN and install my app? Why can't it just be done, right? Why, why, why are we even bothering with writing code when just about all applications are some sort of variation on a theme, which is data gathering and data processing, okay? So if we're reusing all the software, how come we're not able to just, wait a second, have software factories? Why can't we just <laughs> take components and put them together like a bunch of Legos, okay? Well, first of all, if, if uh, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a factory or worked 
in industrial stuff or whatever, you know that if you're if you order a box of ten thousand screws, in the contract it'll usually say, okay, ten percent of these screws may be totally screwed up. So you got ten thousand, you know a hundred are going to have to toss, and that's a, a, something you can count on. You can't do that with software. It doesn't work that way. That's uh, soft, software doesn't have that. Uh, that, that, that level of exactness. You also can't specify components in that same way. If you have two parts to an engine or something like that, where they fit together is a physical thing. It's measurable, okay? You put them together, that's it, the two components work. Software is not, it's, it's not that uh, clean, it's finicky. And mostly because people are finicky, okay? So we'll never reach that quality level of software factories, but CPAN is about as close as I think we can come right now, okay? A factory is a one-way process, okay? The supplier hands it off to the assembler, the assembler assembles probably onto another supplier, chain onward, so and so forth, until it gets to the, uh, to the store shelves, and then you buy it, okay? Open source is a two-way thing. This is why the software factory model, I think, will actually never really work, because it's a collaboration. It's a back and forth. Okay, you don't just give me your module and I go and do it that way. We go back and forth. We maybe pull in Chip and we say, "Hey, Chip," and then Nick comes in. He is, so it, it becomes a, a collaborative process. Um, and and software, honestly, is just not built like Legos. You can't just plug it all together. <laughs> and CPAM, we, we do have. <laughs> we, <laughs> you're snickering, correct? Quality is is a word that we have out for CPAN, and quality to some degree means something, and sometimes doesn't. We have these metrics, and does it have docs, does it have tests, this and that. But, you know, honestly, that's a good way to measure. It's, it's a start. It's certainly not the end, but it's a good way to measure. We, we won't ever get that level of tolerance like you have in the real world with, with, you know, a box of screws, but we can look and have that information out, out, there, out there. Make tests. You run make tests? doesn't work. You can go and look and you can see what's there. Okay, that's, that, that helps keep up a quality of standard, especially if those tests and the failing test reports get reported back. You can help increase that quality. Again, the CPANS test service that I talked about before. Okay, I mean, 99% of the CPANS test things I get, I delete, but I at least look to see well, which ones did fail. Some of them are usually old modules I don't care about, so I'm not. I'm not going to bother with it, but I can know. And if I do see something that I do care about, I can look and I go, okay, why? Why did this fail? And I get this for free. And it helps me improve the quality of my software. The RT bug queue again. CPAN also helps us to stop badly reinventing the wheel. Okay, there's a disease in software called NIH, the not invented here syndrome. Okay, and it's, it's everywhere. Okay, and I'm sure plenty of us, I know I've been uh, you know, I've done it plenty of times. Everybody's done it, okay? There's wheels out there that are already perfectly well shaped. We can all be using them, um, but yet we continue to badly reinvent them. People write an ORM, I think, once a week was the stat we saw. So if somebody <laughs> releases a template engine every two seconds, something like that. Um, you know, people are doing it, um, and they're all over the place. Yeah. Um, with CPM, we can learn from others. Okay, this is all about quality. This is all bringing back to the quality, the overall quality of our software and everybody else's software. Because we can look and we can see, okay, wow, I, I never even knew you could do that. I just learned something. I never knew somebody would be crazy enough to do that. Now I know what not to. Okay, you can learn from a lot of other people's mistakes. If you, if some of, some of the older modules in CPAN are great for this, okay? They're, 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 they're sort of ugly, they're not modern, they're not, you know, the APIs are clunky, this and that. But you know what, if you start digging through that code, you see stuff about operating systems you never even knew existed, but you see how they worked around them. You know, uh, file spec is a great module to really look at and, and see how uh, uh, complete they've made that, because that thing's been around for so long, and it's been used by so many people on so many operating systems, it just got tons of embedded knowledge in there that you can learn from. Even if you decide to not use it and you decide to go and reinvent that wheel yourself, you can mine that knowledge. And ultimately it becomes a more solid foundation, which gives us better quality software, which is that whole dream of building good stuff. So in short, 
open source increases the quality of your software. But if you add community involvement, it increases it continually increases the quality of your software forever. Okay. Until it overflows. Until it overflows. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote this kind of jokingly, and then I started really thinking about this. And it's kind of true, because if I write some open source software and I throw it out there, or if I use someone else's module and I use it as part of my application, okay, as that software is being used, tested, improved, um, just increased in quality, for absolutely no cost and no work on my part except for going into a CPAN uh, <coughs> command line and installing it, I can improve the quality of my software. So Corey can upgrade some module, this or that, and all of a sudden that big vulnerability that uh, it was, was my fault apparently. That was apparently Corey's fault. <laughs> that was leaking millions of dollars of magazines a year. Um, it, it, it's gone because it's he was able to, to, to apply a patch. Okay, um, that that type of thing. It's it's free. Your your software by by being part of the community using it, your software just continually increases. But wait a second. How many of you are uh, consultants or do some sort of consultant type behavior? Or, so. Yeah. What about my billings? Oh no, I'm using all this free software. I'm not writing anything. Well, uh, you know, I, I get paid by the hour. I don't want to not work. No one actually said this would be less work. And Corey made an excellent point in his talk, um, which I wish I had thought of, but anyway, um, which is that uh, the if you involve your 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 module or your work with the community, if you get involved with the community for it, it will probably take twice as long. But it'll be twice the quality, twice as good, twice the quality, twice as better, quality. something like that. Twice the quality for twice the time, um, and you won't get that if you're just doing it on your own. If you take twice as long, it's still not going to be twice as good. And beyond this, if you do manage to finish before you write the rest of the project, it's going to be even more. That is an important point. Okay, yeah, they always like when you build a little it's bit less. Useful. You didn't um, tell them how long it was really going to take, did you? <laughs> Um, sorry, hold on, I get distracted here. Sorry. Well, oh yeah, so you're going to spend a lot of time reading code, okay? Because um, we all suck at documentation, really, when it comes down to it. Um, so you're going to do a lot of source code diving. That takes time. Um, you're probably going to write some tests, whether you actually give them back to the author. It's somewhat, you know, it's nice, but it's not required. Um, but you're going to spend some time doing that. Um, if you're a really, really nice person, you're going to start documenting code. Um, and potentially handing that back. Or even if you don't hand it back, you might need to do that just internally. Because you're, you're, you're using this big giant software package, you need, to, you need to make sure the second guy or the other guy in the team or whatever knows how to do it. So, oops, sorry, I'm jump ahead. So, the point is that it will take you time. Corey's estimate of twice is sometimes good, maybe that's not always the same, but the point is, is that you're not doing less work, you're just not doing it all by yourself, okay? Um, aren't we giving away our work for free? Um, this is a common misconception with some of the business types. Wait a second, I paid you to do that work. Now you're giving it out like it's candy or nothing? Um, what about our competitors? Okay, your, your, your boss, your CT, CIO, or CFO, or whatever, says, wait a second, you can't release our proprietary secrets. Well, you know what? Chief got second law. Corey's second law. Okay. <laughs> Which is quite simply ask yourself this question. <coughs> open source this, will it actually give our competition any advantage? Okay. Honestly, you should never really have to ask this question because you're if you're thinking of open sourcing the entire thing, <laughs> got some problems. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's low-level components. Are we gonna give our competitors any advantage? If it's yes, don't open source it. It's that simple. You don't want to do that. If the answer is no, do open source it because you get all these benefits that I talk about. And you know what, actually, just thinking of this now, if the answer is yes, you might also want to take a step back and look and say, hey, could I cut some components out of this that wouldn't give the competitive advantage and then open source them? Um, so that's, maybe that's my corollary. second add-on to, to my corollary to yeah. Corey's second law. Um, Do you also want to be the only animal in the market? What? Do you want to be the only animal in that market, in that evolution? Right. 
It's pretty slick. Do you want to be the only one of the species left? Do you want to be left? the only kidney in that pie? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to be the only one of the species? Yeah, exactly. Because you are going to be extinct. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. I mean, you know, to go back to the what, what he says, the core, um, the components you want to open source are not the core business logic. They're not your your your, your trade secrets. Okay. <clears throat> and to go back to uh, our idea of designing with CPAN, that's the thing is we, we if we design with CPAN, we we pull together a lot of nice, really solid bases, foundation, foundational components that have nothing to do with our business logic. And then we slap a nice layer of business logic on top of it. And then my favorite thing, we slap a layer of ugly hacks on top of that. Because anytime you work with human beings or business processes or something like that, you have a bunch of stupidity out there. And you have to have some sort of layer that isolates it from your beautiful pre code. Um, but you, you build on top of these foundations, or you build on top of this, this solid open source foundation. Yes, and then you have a yummy cake. Um, so, uh, let's go over a couple of business benefits of open source because ultimately all this is well and good. We all feel great. We're all like, oh, it's a hippie commune. Woo! Great free software we're sharing. But you know what? There's a bottom line, and we all want to get paid. Okay? But there are real business benefits to it. The first, of course, let's come back to free code. Okay? Um, but actually, when you think about it, a lot of open source software is infrastructure software. Infrastructure costs money but no one wants to pay for it, okay? None of our clients want an Oracle license. In fact, our, our, one of our new clients, a, a major part of why they hired us to do what we're doing is so they can get rid of their something like 20 Oracle licenses that they have, okay? Yeah, it's ugly. Um, so they're, they're, they're trying, you know, our, part of our end goal is to, to get rid of that. And that's a lot of money, you know, Microsoft uh, server licenses and all this kind of stuff like that. There's a lot of money that goes into that. Open source software, we've got databases, okay, web servers, languages themselves. I mean, a license, I don't even know what a license for, uh, 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 Sean, what's a license for um, Visual Studio go for these days? It's like 1200 bucks, something like that, right? Yeah. Depends on which version. Maybe yeah, depends on which version, okay? <laughs> but that, that's a lot of money. You're, 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 you're downloading Perl for free, you're downloading BI or Emacs or TextMate, or well, TextMate's a little bit of money, but it's not a lot. Okay, so you, you're, you're getting this stuff for free. You're getting infrastructure. Your operating system, okay? Um, and with CPAN, you're getting libraries. You're getting web frameworks, you're getting templating engines, database access, access layers. You're not running them yourself, and you're not buying, spending thousands of dollars on license fees for them, okay? That right there alone is a business case for using it because you're going to be able to create, the, the software that you end up creating is going to be cheaper and you're going to be doing with high quality components. Community involvement, okay? It's not just, you know, I want my uh, employer to pay me to like sit around on IRC and talk about Metallica, okay? It's, <laughs> all of that's nice. That, that is good, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I won't. Um, <laughs> community involvement is, is it has actually a really great return, okay? Um, you have direct access to the authors, which we talked about before. Um, inside knowledge of new features and bug fixes. Like I was saying, Corey's, Corey's leak that was, you know, sending all these magazines to, uh, to Charles every week, and Charles wasn't paying a cent. He flies a bug fix, woohoo, it's all done, it's fixed, it's great. Knowing about these things, you don't know about them unless you're involved in the community, unless you check up on it, unless you see. You might even be able to influence the features, okay? You have direct contact with the author and you're talking to them and you're going, hey, you know what? This is something my company needs. Let me help you a little bit. Maybe I don't know enough to build it myself, but why don't I help you a little bit and you build it and da 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 and you get this collaboration and all of a sudden you're getting things that your company needs. And it's all because you're spending time on IRC, you're spending time on the mailing list, you're spending time on Pro Monks, you're answering questions, you're sending documentation patches, you're being part of the community and it's coming back to benefit the bottom line. Recruiting, which I talked about before, I promise I'd get back to. Okay, um, your involvement in the community is your resume. Okay, 
just about all of our past, present, and future employees in the company that I work for have come out of the open source community, have come out of the pro community. Okay. Um, the watching people act, how they act in the open source community, how they collaborate with other people in the open source community. Um, their, their, you, know, you can look at their, their code, you can look at non-trivial examples of their code. Um, you, can, you can check the, how they respond to bug reports. <laughs> you can do all that kind of stuff like that. And you know far more than you would ever know than some interview test, you know, please write a linked list for me. You, know, it, you, you, you can preview your employee <laughs> quite a lot through open source software. And you can see, do I work well with this person? Does this person work well with me? And they can preview you. And they can preview you, exactly. It, it becomes a, a, a great way to really just sort of see, is this gonna be a good fit? Because you know, there's nothing worse than hiring somebody and then not being a good fit, and then all the pain, and all you gotta fire them, and then and I need to talk to you about you don't want to go through that. It doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help the bottom line. Okay? And your software. If you release your software, boom, that right there. There's there's a business benefit to having your software out there because you're getting the, those bug reports we talked about again, those patches, those doc patches, which are awesome because at least I hate writing docs. Um, I like doing ASCII art lately. It's not as informative, but it's kind of more fun. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what's that? How many words is an ASCII art work? I don't know. I don't know. Like a ASCII art for blackboard? Eight bit words? Yeah, yeah. Or? That really helped me understand the code totally. Yeah, yeah totally, exactly. So I released a module called Threadboard, and the, the name actually, Matt, Matt Trout came up with the name. Um, and if you've ever done any electronics projects or whatever, you know the breadboard, where you, where you stick the wires in, it's sort of a test board. And, and the it's a dependency injection software, so we thought, oh, that's great, you know, wiring components up. And so we did that, and I didn't have time to write the doc, so I just made an ASCII art picture. Actually, I stole the ASCII art picture from Wikipedia, and it really didn't help. <laughs> nobody, everyone was a model one, what? And that was it. Especially nobody who knew what an actual breadboard was. What's that? Yeah, I, I've been trying to do that. So, yes. So, all of this increases the quality of your software, and again, that increases the quality of the software you're producing for your clients, increases the quality of the software that you're, you're producing for your bosses if you're an in-house shop or whatever, um, and that's a business benefit. That's a direct business benefit right there. That helps increase your bottom line, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so, how are we doing on time, Chris? Keep going. You'll ask one of them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, but everybody wants to go. You can't see that now. What? You got 30 minutes to the next. Oof. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. well, this was my optional section. <laughs> I want to hear the anecdote. Okay. So, uh, well, first, the anecdote is that I, I, I found this Unicode symbol and I thought, damn, that's cool, a Sputnik symbol. I got to figure out how to get that in my slides and I couldn't, so I put it here. <laughs> but I think that's kind of cool that Unicode has a Sputnik symbol. At least that's what I think it is. Yeah, all, all those reasons. Uh, Snowman. Yeah, if you're ever doing the Takahashi talks, I recommend go to the Unicode symbol thing and just find all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I learned that from uh, Audrey Tang. Actually. Sorry, doing the what talks? Takahashi. Data words. Oh, script sorry. CSS package for Firefox. So, um, our current work project, actually that one that's trying to get rid of those 20 Oracle licenses. Okay. Um, yeah. We should just have them give all the money that they're spending on that. Services. Um, it's big on web services. Okay. Services. Uh, so ah, spell check it. <laughs> Somebody needs to replay, release a, a spell checking spell checking presentation model. So it's built on a lot of web services. <laughs> Is that an Arabic service? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, if you've ever done web services before. <clears throat> There's a lot of shit out there. Okay? <laughs> uh, and I'm not just talking modules, I'm just talking ideas, okay? There's a lot of, uh, spent a long time looking at all this stuff. SOAP is one, WDSL is one. If you don't like XML especially, these things are a horror show. Um, however, you know, there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's a lot of ideas out there, and one of the ones that I actually settled on and I really liked is REST, okay? And, and REST is just sort of how the internet works. If you haven't ever heard of it or read about it, I recommend reading about it. 
Um, I think it's representational state transfer. Is that what it stands for? Um, and it's basically building upon the idea of you know, got HTTP methods of get and put and post and delete and patch and options and all these kind of things. And you've got the sort of the infrastructure of the internet. You've got HTTP headers to, uh, you know, should this thing be cached? What was the last time it was modified? And all this kind of stuff like that. Well, that's a lot of useful stuff already there, already spec'd out, already defined. And there's a ton of software out there, caching software, web servers, all this kind of stuff that already understand it. Okay, there's a lot of HTTP parsers. It's a great sort of foundation to build on. So that's what I chose to do. Um, and because I have a fetish for uh, horned mammals, okay, there's, um, Jackal is, is the code name that may or may not ever end up. So if you have any web services work and you're interested in doing any kind of stuff like that and you want to take a look at it, this, you can. It's on GitHub. Okay. Um, it's currently, it's, everything's thrown into one thing. Eventually, we'll be broken up into separate components. Um, I won't get into the, well, I might have time to get into the details of what it is. It's basically REST. We've got some validation things in there. It has a schema thing and it auto generates stuff. It's built on a lot of ideas from WDSL and SOAP, the good ones, not the bad ideas, um, and REST and all sort of put together. So, this is all fine and dandy. And one day I'm just sort of bragging to Corey, GFAT, and I'm saying, hey, look at this cool stuff. And I'm sure he was just sort of like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, not paying any attention, just, you know, uh, virtually rolling his eyes at me. But something must have stuck because. Corey said to Jay Shirley, he said, hey, uh, hey Jay, that thing you were battling about the other day, I think Steven, you know, maybe you might want to talk to him. And so Jay came and talked to me. And lo and behold, we actually had similar needs and goals. Okay? What he was looking to do, I was actually starting to do right now. So all of a sudden, hooray, I have a user. Okay? <laughs> it's not even released to CPAN yet. Actually, it wasn't even on like GitHub yet, actually. Um, and, and, and so Jay expressed interest. Him. I said it wasn't even a good user, but... Yeah, well, you know. Um, so, but I, I put it up on GitHub. Jay started working on it, started poking at it, started reading the code, talking to me about it. You know, there was a lot of very productive conversations of just sort of getting getting my mind going on certain things. Um, and I think you actually have some back-end drivers for it that you... Right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, that was a DPS um, <laughs> that I got pulled up. Yeah, so, yeah, it's... You know, it's 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 resource. It's about resources. So you're storing resources. I have just a plain old in-memory one. I have one for MongoDB. Jay needed one for DBIX class, so he wrote that. So collaboration. Also, and you know what? It's all because I'm involved in the community, and it's all because Corey and Jay are involved in the community. It's all there. Suddenly, we're helping each other out, and I don't have to pay him. Corey has to pay him. <laughs> I don't have to pay him. Um, but wait, it actually gets better. Because in the course of Jay talking to me and me talking to Jay, we actually found out that his phase one is actually a lot of our phase two. So not only did I get a user of my software, actually both of us got a collaborator. Because what Jay needs to do, I'm going to eventually need to do. So I'm going to be working on his software, he's going to be working on my software. And I don't have to pay Steven. And he doesn't have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and I am cheap. I do keynotes, man. <laughs> Chris, I'll give you your cut later. <laughs> but that, you know, that's the point. You know, I had to do this for work, and it actually it did take a little while. We, uh, Jeremy, you'll recall the the back and forth with the lawyers um, with this client because you know they 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 had a. They had a lot of lawyers on staff. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but um, you know, we had, we had to go back and forth and really convince them of our methods. We had to get them to say yes, it's okay about five or six times before we, we felt comfortable that they weren't going to sue us because we released software. Um, and ultimately, what they said is actually they, they they have Corey's second law too, which is just don't upload the whole thing to CPAN. That's all they cared about. And and actually, when I told him that I had a collaborator and a user already, the client was actually pleased to hear that. Because he, he's he's not open source ignorant. Um, maybe the lawyers in his company are, but he was not open source ignorant. So he he liked that idea. He liked the fact that that hey look, this is going to be bigger than just that. We'll get we'll get uh, other people testing and other use cases. So I talked too fast. So we're at the conclusion. Thirty minutes was actually an upper limit, I believe. Okay. Um, so if I can leave you with any message, it's not just about the free code, which I think everybody in here knows. Okay. Um, because if you didn't know that, you probably wouldn't be here. 
okay? But hopefully too, maybe when you go out and the next client that you have who says, well, I don't know about open source stuff, or the next employer you have who's worried about it, maybe I, maybe you can use some of the bullshit I have in here to bullshit your way into <laughs> being able to do open source on the job. Um, it's about the community involvement. It really is. The, 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 you, by using high quality open source software, you improve the quality of your software. By being involved in the community, you improve it even more. Okay? And that's a key thing. Basically, the more you give, the more you get. Okay? Now, let's go ride some go-karts and drink some beer. Yeah.